And good afternoon, friends. It is time for our Lunch and Learn. And today, we're going to be talking about monopolies in our food supply. Now, I was a little bit surprised when I came across this article because we go to the grocery store and we see aisles and aisles and aisles and aisles of food. Of course, we live in a very rich country, and I'm very, very thankful uh, that we do. We also, just if anybody out there cares, we also support a lot of charities that are in other nations, so we do that as well. So if that's important to you, then we can do that as well. One of the things that this particular report said, and these are some statistics, and we're going to look at these and what do they mean to us. Four, four, four corporations own 50% of the world's seeds, not the United States seeds, but the world seeds, four companies. 75% of crop diversity has been lost from 1900 to 2000. That three quarters of our plant diversity have been lost. So when we're talking about the homogenization of our food supply, I had to really look into that. What does that actually mean? I know homogenization as something that we do to milk. What does that mean? We take milk. If you live in another country other than the United States, right? I have lived in Scotland. I have lived in England. The milk still comes in glass jars. It's delivered by the dairy every morning. It has a cap on it, tinfoil cap. Did I call it something else? Anyway, when you get that milk, there's this much of cream on top of that milk. And before you take that milk and use that milk for your family, you will shake that milk to redistribute the fat in the milk. It is the most glorious milk in the whole world, all right? Here in the United States, unless you get raw milk, you don't get that. You get homogenized milk. What that means, they forced the fat globules, the cream, they forced it through a very small sieve to make it more uh, able to integrate to the milk so you don't have that cream, right? So, Homogenization means to make everything the same. So our food supply, under the guise of globalization, is being homogenized. All right. And so we don't want that. I did not even know that was a thing. I mean, I knew about industrial farms. I knew about local farms and all that kind of stuff. We try and buy things that are sourced locally because I believe that is the most healthy thing. Why do I believe that? Well, because personally, I believe in God. I believe God's really smart. I believe God made food for us to eat. And so where I'm living, the food that is grown in my environment is going to have the best nutritional blend for anything that I am facing in my area, you know, where I live. If I buy food from another country, if I buy food from another area, it may not have the nutrients that I particularly need. That's why in our healthcare practice, Abundant Health and Wellness, we source our herbs that are wild crafted and hand uh, manufactured. Now, why is that? Because we don't want mass farming. We want the herbs to grow where God wants them to grow so they have the nutrients that they need so that they do the work that they're supposed to do and they help us to get well. So it's a whole uh, world view about buying local, right? Or buying things where they grow naturally. So with homogenization of the food supply, what they're doing is they are cultivating foods and they're changing foods or genetically modifying foods so that they will grow everywhere the same way all the time. And what that's doing is um, removing the biodiversity. Now, Biodiversity, we're all about diversity and everything here in the United States, we hear about diversity, right? We want to have biodiversity because when we introduce different species into our bodies, we are introducing different nutrients. We're introducing different bacteria that go along with those different nutrients. And so it keeps our immune system on high alert and we are just healthier if we have a more diverse gut microbiome. Okay. 15 crops, only 15 crops provide 90% of the world's calories. Now, I thought that was just bizarre because I eat more than 15 different things in a week. Just saying. Plants, vegetables, meat, 
whatever. I eat more than 15 different varieties in a week, and I hope you do too. So there's a book that came out in 2022 called Eating to Extinction, the world's rarest foods and why we need to save them. The author is a man called Dan Saladino, and he is a food uh, columnist for the BBC. He examines why the scope of our diet has drastically narrowed even when the food supply appears to be very, very uh, sufficient. So when he's looking at the biodiversity, he's finding that yes, we may have a lot of food, but it's all just one type, and that one type is causing some issues with our guts and different things. So he says, and this is a quote, over the past several decades, globalization has homogenized what we eat and has done so ruthlessly. Of the roughly 6,000 6, different plants once consumed by human beings, only nine, nine, not 9,000, nine remain major uh, staples for today. Of those nine, just three, rice, wheat, and corn provide 50% of all of our calories. Now, when you tell me that, I am not surprised that we are as sick as we are if 50% of our calories are rice, corn, and wheat. We know here in the United States, wheat is 100% genetically modified, and corn is 95% genetically modified. Not sure about rice. However, I'm pretty sure it's sprayed with Roundup because it's a grain, and all of our grain here in the United States is sprayed with Roundup not once, but twice, twice, in order to pop all of those seeds out so the farmer gets a higher yield, which I'm all in favor of the farmer getting a higher yield. Uh, what we want, though, is for the humans that consume these grains to have really, really good food, okay? 15 crop plants provide 90% of the world's food energy intake. 15 crop plants. That is crazy. Now, the four companies that own these seeds, okay, you're not going to be surprised about that. The first one is, um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Here we go. Bear, okay. Now, we know bear. I know bear as the aspirin people, right? Bear aspirin. Now, we know bear makes more than that. Did you know that bear also is the company that owns Monsanto? Monsanto is the company that makes Roundup. Roundup is what we're talking about here, okay? So Bayer is your number one company that owns the seeds. The second one is a company called uh, Corteva. The set third one is a company called Kim China. And the fourth one is a company called Lima Grain, okay? Those four companies own almost all of the seeds that we can have here in the United States. Did you know, I did not know this, that 95% of milk here in the United States comes from just one breed of cattle. I did not know that. I mean, I knew there were dairy cows as opposed to, I don't know, beef cows, whatever they're used for. I knew that dairy cows were a certain specific type. I personally probably thought it was just these are the mama cows, and what they do is produce milk, and so they're kept separate. We don't want to put them in the food supply because they're in the food supply with the milk, right? But no, it's not just any breed of cow. It's only the Holstein breed that we're getting our milk from. Now, maybe some of you out there can tell me why, because I didn't have time to research that. Half of all of the world's cheese, all right, I like cheese. Cheese is a good food. It's not a good food if it's got antibiotics and hormones in it, right? So I buy organic cheese because organic cheese does not have hormones or antibiotics in it. But most people don't. So the cheese, half of all the world's cheese is made with bacteria or enzymes made by just one company. One, all right? One in four beers drunk around the world is the product of one brewer, all right? Now, when I go to the grocery store, I don't drink beer. I don't particularly drink it. Don't care if you do. But when I go to the grocery store, we go down that aisle. There's 
brand after brand after brand after brand after brand. So you would think there were that many different producers, but no, one in four is produced by the same boar. So there's a lack of biodiversity in that, which means that we're going to have a lack of biodiversity in our nutrition. If we're not getting the nutrition that we need, then we're going to have issues being healthy, and I don't want to have that. This man, this author, Saladino, says that crop diversity is worth preserving because it is the legacy of thousands of years of farming and food production. Now, just think about that. Whenever you were a little girl and your grandmother or your great-grandmother made this fabulous dish, and we're all different in that, okay, we're all different in what we like, one of the foods that my grandmother would make, she would make a dish called holopsy, right? And what it is is a cabbage roll filled with sausage and rice, and the way she did it, it was fabulous. Now, we're not trying to do that today. It does not taste the same, and maybe it's because it's not made with the love that my grandmother put in when she made it. But it doesn't taste the same. It probably doesn't taste the same because we've lost that biodiversity that we used to have, which made food taste better and made food taste richer. Now, think about, and you probably have had this experience, you go to the grocery store and you buy a tomato for your salad, right? You bring the tomato in, you cut the tomato, there's no ripe aroma of that great vegetable. But, you go down the street to your local farmer's market or you are blessed, like I am blessed, and I have people bring produce to me that they have grown in their little garden at their home, right? They come and they bring that to me. You slice into that tomato and that aroma just, I mean, it just attacks your uh, olfactory nerve. I start salivating, and I'm not even a real tomato fan, to be honest with you. But when I get a homegrown tomato, and I cut into that, and it's got that sweet aroma, slice it, salt and pepper it, and there you go. I can go to town on that. So we're losing that biodiversity because we're not doing the individual farms, you know, as a people, and only four companies, four companies, controlling most of our food supply. So that is a big deal. Now, in 1990, which doesn't seem like it was that far off, but it was, there were laws that were passed that would protect the bioengineered crops. Now, this is when uh, Monsanto uh, came out with the um, uh, BT corn and BT tomatoes and just, just different things like that. And they, because they genetically modified these vegetables, they were able to patent them. Well, they lobbied the lawmakers here in America, and they even made it so if you bought seeds other than the official seeds from these four companies, you could be uh, sued and those could, because it was an illegal activity. Now, I didn't really believe that. I've read it multiple times in multiple places, and I have seen here in the United States first-person accounts from farmers who are being told and showing me the check that the government writes them not to produce the crops that they have traditionally produced. That doesn't make any sense to me. Why would we want to stop food production? Why would we want to um, take the livelihood away from these people that want to do that? And why would we want to pay people to sit and be idle? That just doesn't, that just doesn't work on any of my uh, any of my worldviews there. We should all be industrious. We should all be producing. We should all be creating. And we should all have the good of our friends, family, and the world at large at the topmost of our um, intention as we move forward. So these four companies control the food supply, okay? The organization Civil Eats in 2018 described a monopoly a bit differently citing research on seed industry consolidation by the Philip by Philip Howard of Michigan State University. According to Howard, who is a socialist, the big four seed companies include Bayer, we talked about that, Corteva, which we mentioned that. Now, Corteva is a firm that was created as a result of the merger between Dow and DuPont. Now, Dow is a chemical company. DuPont Industrial Chemicals, both of them. Why would they, chemical companies, be monopolizing the seed world? It doesn't make any sense to me. Is that because they're 
um, genetically modifying the seeds is that certainly not just because they have diversity in their investment, all right, because that's not what they're known for. ChemChina, as we mentioned before, and then BASF. BASF is a German chemical com company. Those four own more than 60% of proprietary seal seed sales globally. They control the 60% of proprietary seed sales. Now, there is a food and agriculture organization under the UN, and it has expressed concern of this trend, saying what has happened to biodiversity. And answering that question, the extension of industrial patenting and other intellectual property systems to living organisms has led to widespread cultivation and the rearing of fewer varieties and breeds. This results in a more uniform, less diverse, but more competitive global market. The FAO estimated in 2010 that 75 percent of the crop diversity had been lost and warned that if that trend continued, right, that it would threaten the global food supply. Now, why is that? Why, why does not having uh, 6,000 plants to choose from, but we only have maybe 15 plants to choose from, why is that a big deal? Well, think about it. If you have everything that has the same DNA, you have everything that is uniform, homogenized, right, then you get a pest, a superbug or a super insect or whatever that comes into the environment and it decimates everything that is susceptible to it. And if you only have one breed, if you only have one variety, then guess what? It's going to pretty much wipe out everything. And so we don't want to do that. We don't want to be a part of that. We want to have food security. Now, honestly, I work in a clinic all day long. I, I like to garden. I like to do that kind of thing. That's my weekend passion. I cannot sustain a garden on the weekend. That's something that you have to look at every day, every couple of days, and it just, I don't have the time to do that. So I trust the people in my environment, in my area, that do the local farming, that they're doing it, and they're doing a good job without the pesticides and herbicides and that kind of thing that is, is not good. So, less variety equals greater risk of losing the food supply, all right? Biodiversity makes production systems and livelihoods more resilient to shocks and stress, including the effects of climate change. Okay, so all of this was in the 2019 assessment of the state of the world's biodiversity for food and agriculture, all right? In 2022, there was a report. Uh, the people that reported was, this is their name, no patents on seeds. Okay, they don't think that that's a good thing. Honestly, I didn't know you could patent seeds that were natural. I know if you genetically modify them, then yes, they're not natural. But I thought things that were natural, that grew the way God wanted them to grow, that just grew, you know, we call them volunteers. They just come up. I didn't know that you could patent that, but apparently you can't. All right. Um, it says it produced an international coalition of the same name that promotes or that says patents granted on the usage of naturally occurring genes on seeds, on plants and on their harvest represents one of the biggest threats of global food security and regional food sovereignty. Now, it's interesting to note that in Europe, they quit doing this in 2017. However, not here in the United States. So that's something that we need to kind of ask ourselves, why? Why? What is the uh, motivation there? Yes, follow the money. Absolutely follow the money because everything is done with money, right? And money is what we need in order to do things we want to do. But there also has to be some, some intellectual integrity. There has to be societal integrity. I would never, and I hope everybody is like this, I would never do something in my clinic that would hurt somebody. I would never do something in my home that would hurt somebody. I would never do something in my community that would hurt somebody. And if it was a possibility to hurt somebody, I would have, you know, second thoughts about doing that. Obviously, in our industrial farming across the world, because it's all been homogenized, they don't have that same worldview because 
they are spraying the uh, plants, they are spraying uh, the crops with these harmful chemicals and they hurt us as well. Patents on genes and genetic varieties block access to biodiversity for plant breeding. Now, all of us are going to remember when we started studying genetics, probably fourth grade health class here in the United States, right? We looked at the experiments where they took this little flower and they took this little flower of a different color. They took a paintbrush and they uh, worked with the pollen and they pollinated a different breed, a different species, and then that's how they created more biodiversity and that's how we got different colors, that's how we got different smells and that kind of thing. And that's really, really important and that's also important in our food supply. Now there is a film series called Rich Appetites. So you want to look at that. I have not seen all of it, but they talk about seed laws and they talk about other things having to do with the way our food is processed today. So that would, it, it's a little short videos. They're not too long, but it's very, very interesting information. All right. Some of these laws that were passed in the 1990s makes it illegal for small farmers to exchange seeds. I'll give you some of mine. I'm going to plant what you got. I'm going to give you some of mine. That makes it illegal. All right. And um, they can't even save their own seeds for replanting. They've got to buy the seeds from those big four companies. Corporate control of seeds violates the farmer's rights under the international conventions and endangers people's livelihood, increases hunger, and it erodes cultural uh, traditions. There's a second film in that series called Seeds that you want to look at, all right? So, Rich Appetites is a film series produced by AgriWatch and the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, all right? It examines why these corporate powerful food uh, industries, how they force their methods onto other countries in the guise of charities. So, we're going to name some names here. All right, but all familiar to us because these are international names. So, billionaire philanthropists such as Bill and, Ma Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Rockefeller Foundation are pushing U.S. style industrial agriculture across the globe, including Africa. Industrial agriculture is the largest single cause of biodiversity loss worldwide. It fails to solve the hunger problem and it hurts small scale farmers and the planet. Although Western-led charitable organizations may mean well, their insistence on imposing this approach to farming has done more harm than good, according to those people. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation claims that industrialization benefits farmers and the poor. The foundation's support of African farming groups, for example, comes from its commitment to transforming small farms into larger farms they're telling them that you're going to get rich if you do it our way and that kind of thing, right? But when they are examining their efforts, they're coming up short. An effort to field the world's hungry more efficiently was the first uh, instance of that was after World War II, I think it was, when there was a lot of hunger because the world was ravaged by the war. It was a World War, World War One, and World War Two, and so. I don't know the names of the, of the people that did this, but they learned how to grow wheat. They learned how to grow uh, the crops more. Um, they had a greater yield to that. And so that did solve a lot of the world's problems, which I'm all for doing that. I think we do need to feed the hungry. I'm, I'm all for that. We participate in programs that do that. Um, the resulting trade-off is a loss of food diversity. Saladano says we cannot have a one size fits all approach to feeding the world based on a reductionist vision of producing more and more calories. You look around in America for sure and we know that that's true. We don't need more and more calories. Science is only beginning to reveal to us the complexity and the sophistication of many of the traditional food and farming systems. Research deserves investment alongside technologies. Now, there are technologies, emerging technologies that you can use, all right, 
And so I want to talk about a couple of these. All right, there's one uh, company. Uh, it's called uh, Vavdania International, okay, and it is based in Italy. Its founder is a woman named Vandana Shiva. I think it's Shiva. Uh, Vandana, I think that's a girl's name, but I may be wrong. Anyway, she's the founder of the India-based Navdana movement, all right? She calls the homogenization and globalization of food biopiracy, bio which I thought was a cool word. And her company conducts research, it advocates, and it enters into partnerships to help small farmers maintain control over what they produce and how they produce it. Now, I'm going to tell you, if I was a farm girl and I had my own farm, I would not be real happy about the government coming in and telling me, you can only sell this or you can only plant this or you can only buy seeds from these companies. I would not be very happy about that at all. So there are two other working groups that are helping to change agricultural practices. One is a German nonprofit foundation on future farming. And then there is a Swiss nonprofit called BioVision. Okay, it recently published the optimistic transformation of our food systems, the making of a paradigm shift. Now, in this paper, they advocate global efforts to shift farming and food production out of the hands of the homogenized industrial farm and back into what they call the agroecological model. That's local farms buying and selling locally and creating more biodiversity. All right, following this model, it, the farmers will be able to nourish a world population of 10 billion people by the mid 21st century while remain, maintaining crop diversity and reducing dependence on the industrial farm. Technology also can drive this, and we all like our apps. I like my app as well. Um, there is technology that can provide us with the means of preserving food diversity. There's a farmer in Southwest China, all right, who's endeavoring to save biodiversity in his area, and he is selling different varieties of rice directly to the consumer via WeChat. Okay, WeChat is an app, but there are other apps. There's a local, uh, sorry, Locavor, Locavor, all right, Simply Local, Farm Fresh 24-7, and then Farmish. So those are four other apps. I don't know if we have WeChat here. I'm not real big on farming apps. I haven't, you know, looked into that myself. But Locavar, Simply Fresh, I'm oh, sorry, Simply Local, Farm Fresh 24-7, and Farmish. So buying locally leads to cooking with foods that are in season and that have, as I said earlier, it's got what we need to be healthy in this environment. Whatever smog we've got, whatever acid rain we've got, whatever chemtrails we've got, okay? If we believe in an intelligent design, which I do, when we buy local, we're going to have that biodiversity that we need so that we can maintain the biodiversity in our microbiome. And we've talked tons about that in previous programs, all right? We don't want homogenized anything. We want everything to be wild crafted. We want it to be raw. We want it to be as minimally uh, processed as absolutely possible so that we get the best nutrition that we can have so that we can be the best version of ourselves that we can be. So that was a lot. That was a lot of information to give you. And so if you have any questions, let me know. Um, if something was not clear, uh, then let me know. I'm, I'm personally going to look at these videos and just learn some more about this because I want to make the best decisions that we can make for our family. And I want to make sure that we can cultivate more biodiversity. And it might mean, you know, we just got to buy from other people that we buy from. And so that's something that all of us can uh, check out and to look and see what we can do to make that difference. So as always, we want you to take the weekend. This for us in the United States is a long weekend because it is the 4th of July weekend. So we want to say go out and celebrate and be thankful for the freedoms that we do have. Take care of your family. Take care of yourself. Do all the things that you do on the weekend so that you can come back, fight another day next week, and win your race. Love you guys. Take care. Bye-bye.